and do some uh, philosophy first and dream second. Okay. There we go. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> I've got a bunch of quotes, but let me put a couple of things down. Carl Jung understands Hermetic philosophy, Gnostic philosophy. <clears throat> By the way, what is it? Platonic thought, now please just do one thing. Subtract metaphysics and the dialectic. What's left in those books? The result? Is hermetic philosophy or Gnosticism? <clears throat> now, Carl Jung is a very curious gentleman. In the two essays that he wrote, he says, if the truth be known, I'm really a philosopher, but considering the poor state in which philosophy is in the universities, <clears throat> I can't call myself a philosopher. <clears throat> well, he's right, uh, but he's a Gnostic philosopher who does his best to avoid Plato. That's the whole problem with Carl Jung. Okay, can we skip the rest? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I brought a couple of quotes for you to have a little fun. This comes out of his work, Psychology and Alchemy. Give us the page number, could you? Yeah? Sure. I'm also, starting. These are free PDFs online, Psychology and Alchemy. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I'm going to be using his book, and I'm starting on the work. Now, why start, you see he has many chapters, he has a relatively short chapter on the work. Now, why am I spending time on this, the work? because it's in the section on the work that he describes how alchemy functions. Hey, once we have that, we can immediately compare it with Platonic thought. <clears throat> so I'm on uh, he calls the work the procedure by the way it's the procedure that's what he calls it So, first quote on page 242. Generally speaking, the primary materia, or the prima materia, indeed the stone itself, or the secret of its production, 
is revealed to the operator by God. Thus, Laurentinius Ventura says, but one cannot know the procedure unless it be a gift of God or through the instruction of a most experienced master. And the source of it all is the divine will. Hylande, another alchemist. Prepare, prepare our chaotic or court chaos nature in the highest simplicity and perfection from a special secret divine vision and revelation without further probing and pondering of causes. Hollandi explains the necessity for divine enlightenment in saying that the production of the stone transcends reason and that only a supernatural and divine knowledge knows the exact time for the birth of the stone. His comment. This means that God alone knows the prima materia after the time of Paracelsus. The source of enlightenment was this lumina natura. Quote, this light is the true light of nature which illuminates all the God-loving philosophers who come into this world. It is in the world and the whole edifice of the world is beautifully adorned and will be naturally preserved by it until the last and the great day of the Lord. But the world doesn't know it. Above all, it is the subject of the Catholic and great stone of the philosophers which the whole world has before its eyes, yet it knows not. So the third quote from the um, Adoran, I pray you look with the eyes of the mind at the little tree and the gr uh, of the grain of wheat regarding all its circumstances so that you may bring the tree of the philosophers to grow. Young. This seems to point to an act of imaginary imagination as the thing that sets the process going. What starts the process? See this procedure, process? Active imagination? Yeah, that's right. Contemplating a seed? Now, He's a very skilled writer, but you know what? It takes him 20 pages to tell us what he means by this. And uh, in a sense, that's a put down. I meant it. <laughs> well, you see, he has a problem. Because as we go further, the more he, he points out that this is a philosophical path, the more you have to ask, why isn't he on it? <laughs> and the last chapter is a defense of Christianity and alchemy. How you can understand even the church's mass by its parallel with alchemy. So, enough of that for the moment. Okay, I got another one for you. One of the great alchemical works is called the Rosarium Philosophorum. It says, I'm on page 244, paragraph 
369. What there, uh, what, pardon me, who therefore knows the salt and its solution knows the hidden secret of the wise men of old. Therefore, turn your mind upon salt, but not on it alone. Turn it upon the mind. That's the science concealed and the most excellent and the most hidden secret of all among the ancient philosophers. Right? Yeah, 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 I'm with you. Therefore, direct your feelings, your senses, your reasons, your thoughts upon the salt alone. Jung's comment, the anonymous author of the Rosarium says in another place that the work must be performed with a true and not fantastic imagination. Right? You have to have a special kind. Does he tell us yet? No. no. Have to hold your breath. For the stone, when the search <clears throat> lies heavy on the searcher, it's the key moment in the alchemy process. I'm on 246. <clears throat> Therefore, all of those who desire to attain the blessings of this should apply themselves to study, should gather the truth from the books, not from invented fables and untruthful works. There is no way by which this art can be truly found alchemy, except by completing their studies and understanding the words of the philosophers. <clears throat> My good friend Bernard of Treviso, he should collect the the books of different authors, because otherwise it is impossible to understand them. And he should not throw them away, throw away a book which he has read once or twice or even three times, although he has not understood it. But he should read it again and again, 10, 20, 50, 100 times or even more. At last he will see wherein the authors are mainly agreed and there the truth lies hidden. Lully, one of the earliest uh, alchemists, he came out of uh, southern France, by the way, in the uh, uh, 12th century. <clears throat> Studied Arabic, mastered Arabic, and had a great, giant, a great deal of time throughout the Islamic and the European world. Okay, Lily. Now this is a, a somewhat of a, a paraphrase and then a quote. <clears throat> Quoting Lily as his authority, the same author says, that owing to their ignorance, men are, able, are not able to accomplish the work until they have studied universal philosophy, which will show them things that are unknown and hidden from others. Quote, Therefore, our stone belongs not to the vulgar, but to the very heart of philosophy. Therefore, one should devote oneself to the study of books of the old philosophers and to acquaint himself with the very, very materia. This is another quote again. Uh, continuing Richardus and Angelicus 
Turn back, brethren, to the way of truth of which you are ignorant. I counsel you for your own sake to study and to labor with steadfast meditation on the words of the philosophers whence the truth can be summoned forth. 248. The importance of, uh, the importance or necessity of understanding and intelligence is insisted upon all through the literature, not only because intelligence above the ordinary is needed in the performance of this difficult work, says Jung, but because it is assumed that a species of magical power capable of transforming even brute men and brute matter dwells in the universal mind. Dorn, in truth, the form which is the intellect of man is the beginning, middle, and end of the process. And this, and this form is made clear by the saffron color, which indicates that men, the, the man is of the greatest and principal form in the, in the uh, opus or the work. Dorn, says Jung, draws a complete parallel between the alchemical work <clears throat> and the moral intellectual transformation of man. Then he quotes, a work which I think would be curious. A treatise on Platonic tra tritologies. The author presents four series of correspondences, each containing four books. Now, in this work, He uh, works out a table, you see. And uh, I wonder whether or not, and of course it comes from this chap, what was his name again? Plato, isn't it? Yeah, Platonic Tetratology. So, um, he says, you have to understand that this uh, Tetralogy is, um, by the way, um, is it likely that there's a tritology in the sixth book of Plato's Republic called The Divided Line? Yeah. Oh, well, look. Now, these two, right? that deals, of course, with the intellectual. And intellect, by the way, when I use the word intellect, I mean that part of man within the mind that is capable of apprehending the divine luminosity and the nature of the source of that divine luminosity. Therefore, it can be called the eye of the soul. Understanding, the goal of understanding is not the everyday world. The whole goal of the understanding in Plato is to understand the ideas that are standing behind or in, can be inferred from that divine illumination experience. Because out of that divine illumination experience one can infer all of the ideas putting them in terms of a metaphysical system, being able to show how each of the ideas relate to one another, is understanding. That also can be called metaphysics. This realm is a phenomenal realm. 
Doxe, opinion. And Plato calls it it's everyday world. Well, Carl Jung has in this table, he's described knowing beautifully, understanding. There's a problem with this category. It is so loaded with alchemical symbols that he doesn't explain it in English or in the text. But image thinking, the phenomenal world, he's got that. So therefore, uh, until someone can illuminate what he meant by the third category, it's roughly the same thing. Now let me give you a good quote on the most important one of all, the fourth. This activity is subject to the ratio or the anima rationalis, that is, the highest faculty bestowed to, to God by man. Thank you, thank you. In the book, he quotes this, that is out of that very act, that very work, the Platonic Quatrium. Invisible and immovable God, whose will created the intelligence. From the will and intelligence, to be understood here as intellectus, is produced the simple soul. But the soul gives rise to the discriminated natures from which the composite natures are produced, and these show that a thing cannot be comprehended save by something superior to it. The key to Plato's work here, as he insists, that the relationship between these successively is model, copy, model, copy. So that if you want to understand the nature of this image thinking, which he likens to prisoners in the cave, in the allegory of the cave, you have to see that they are functioning through a level of belief. Right? In the same way, understanding. To understand how understanding works, you must draw its premises from the experience and then put them together in a rational system called metaphysics. So model copy, model copy, all the way through. Oh yeah, and grossly, this is the model, this is the copy. Um, the soul is above nature, and through it, nature is comprehended. But the intelligence is above the soul, and through it, the soul is comprehended. And the intelligence is comprehended by that which is above itself, and is surrounded by the one. God, whose nature it is, is, to, is not to be comprehended. So this entire system presupposes that this knowing, its proper object is divine illumination. But it's only through the dialectic of Plato that can one can reach the source of the divine, in, divine illumination, which is the very nature of the one or 
more properly, the oneself. And he's got a, quite an interesting section here on the Arabic 10th century and how the Arabic thought entered into Spain through the Islamic uh, uh, Sp Spanish kingdom. And I'll skip it. Um, oh. The method. Through, through uh, time and exact definition, things are converted into intellect. Inasmuch as the parts are assimilated to one another, in composition and in form, but a, on account of this proximity to the anima ra rationalis, the brain had to be assimilated to the amalgam. And, and the, uh, uh, the anima is simple, as we have said. Carl Jung's statement about that. The assumption underlining this train of thought is the causative effect of analogy. In other words, just as the psyche and uh, just as the psyche, the multiplicity of sense impressions produces the unity and the simplicity of an idea, so the primal waters finally produces the fire, the ethereal substance. Consequently, he now quotes Dorn, and he ends it with, uh, um, the attentive reader will conclude that one must pass from the metaphysical to the physical by a philosophical procedure. Um, now, if you're interested in the philosophical procedure, that's the process, and he doesn't get there for quite a while. <laughs> All right? So, um, um, now, uh, he outlines on page 258 what he calls um, the transformation of matter. And you will see it might be difficult to find the word matter in this description, but I like it since it goes three through three major steps, and I know you'll enjoy it. <clears throat> I'm on 258. Not much effort is needed at the beginning of the work. It is sufficient to approach it with a free and empty mind, as the text says. But one important rule must be observed. The mind must be in harmony with the work, and the work must be, a, must be above, above all else. Another text says that in order to acquire the golden understanding, one must keep, eye, one must keep the eyes of the mind and the soul open, observing and contemplating by means of that inner light which God has lit in nature and in our hearts from the very beginning. Uh, this is a discussion on the various transformations of matter. I think you agree you didn't find any. No. But that's normal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, then, comes uh, another worker called Alphidius, Know that you cannot have this science until you have purified your mind. For God 
which means that you must extinguish all corruption in your heart. And there's a footnote by uh, uh, Dravidovich McGee, Gesundheit, and the best way of removing that corruption is philosophical midwifery. Okay. Um, now the work. Work must be done and defined by two things, meditation and imagination. Okay, what is meditation? The word meditatio defines meditation as follows. The word meditatio is used when a man has an inner dialogue with someone unseen. Maybe with God, when he is invoked, or with himself, or with a good angel. What page are you on here? I'm on 262. Okay, thanks. Paragraph something or other, 5390. All right. All right, why? This meditation, according to the Hermetic dictum or Hermetic philosophy, <clears throat> quote, as all things proceed from the one through the meditation of the one, must therefore be understood in this alchemical sense as a creative dialogue, by means of which things pass from an unconscious potential to a manifest one. Therefore, Kumrath, um, actually it's from, uh, I think it's Dorn, is it? Uh, no, no, Philalethes. Again, to meditate means that through a dialogue with God, yet more spirit will be infused into the stone and will become even still more spiritualized. Quote, okay? This is our good friend, Kumrath, the alchemist. <clears throat> Therefore, study, meditate, sweat, work, cook. <laughs> so will a healthful food be open to you, which comes from the heart of the sun of the great, great world, a water, which is the son of the great world, pours forth from his body and heart, and to be for us the true and natural aqua veda. Young. Likewise, the meditation of heavenly good, mentioned earlier, must be taken in the sense of a living dialectical relationship with certain dominance of the unconscious. Now, you know, to talk about using the dialectic and study for the unconscious means you have to re redefine what he means by unconscious because it's obviously uh, taken in a higher sense because <laughs> dialect dialectic cannot be produced, acted upon, and exercised in the unconscious. Um, So, you know, what is imagination? Now that we got a little bit of meditation, imagination is the star in man, the celestial or super celestial body. Quote Jung. This astonishing definition throws a special light on the fantasy processes connected with the work or opus. Um, the concept of imagination, or magio, uh, paragraph 396, page 267, is perhaps the most important key to the understanding of this work, the work, the opus. The author of the treatise 
how he's quoting, De Sulfur speaks of the imaginative faculty of the soul in that passage where he's trying to do just what the ancients had failed to do, that is, give a clear indication of the secret of the art. Well, this peculiarity is divine, since divine wisdom is only partly enclosed in the body of the world. The greatest part, the greater part of it, is outside, and it imagines far higher things than the body of the world can conceive. And these things are outside nature. God's own secret. The soul is the example of this. It too imagines many things in the utmost profundity, just as God does. True, but the soul imagines happens only in the mind. What God imagines happens in reality. The soul, therefore, has the absolute and independent power to do things, to do other things. But when it desires, it has the greatest power over the body, for otherwise our philosophy would be in vain. Um... The imagination, 269, as the alchemists understand it, is in truth a key that opens the door to the secret of the opus or the work. We now know that it is, <laughs> it is a question of representing and realizing these greater things, which is the anima of God's behalf, on God's behalf, imagines creatively and with a, an extra natural or to put it in the most modern language a question of actualizing these contents of the unconscious which are outside of nature. The place or the, re, or the medium of realization is neither mind nor matter but the intermediate realm, the subtle reality, which can only be adequately expressed by the symbol. And the symbol is neither abstract nor concrete, neither rational nor irrational, neither real nor unreal. It's always both. Every original alchemist, as it were, this is Carl speaking, for every original alchemist, as it were, builds himself a more or less individual edifice of ideas consisting of the dicta or the writings of the philosophers. And of composite analogies to the fundamental concepts of alchemy. Generally, these alchemy, these these uh, uh, analogies are taken over uh, all over the place. Treatises were written for the purpose of supplying the artist with analogy, analogical making material. The method of alchemy, psychologically speaking, is one of boundless amplification. What does it mean by amplification? What page are you on? Uh, 277. Okay. Hey, the amplification is always appropriate when dealing with some kind of dark experience, which is so vaguely 
adumbrated that it must be enlarged and expanded by helping set into psychological contacts in order to understand it at all. That is why in analytical psychology we resort to amplification in the interpretation of dreams. The amplification forms the second part of the work. It is understood by the alchemist as theory, theory, theory. Originally, the theory was the so-called hermetic philosophy. But quite early on, it was broadened by the assimilation of certain ideas taken over from Christian dogma. In the oldest alchemical known to the West, the hermetic fragments were handed down mostly through Arabic translations, originals, direct contact Contact with the Corpus Hermeticum was only established in the second half of the 15th century with our good friend Marcello Petrino, who did the first translation of Plato from Greek to Latin in the 15th century. By the way, if you look over some of our material, you'll see that all alchemical texts that are noted in the study that I reproduced start in the 15th century, mm -hmm. uh, coinciding with Petrino's work on Plato mm -hmm. and uh, the great work on uh, Pseudo Dionysius. Okay, a couple of more. Uh, um, I'm going to skip the symbolism. But he does repeat the role of Hermes as central. Hermes is central. Um, when an alchemist speaks of Mercury or Mercurius, the face of it, he means Quicksilver. But inwardly, he means the world creating spirit, concealed or imprisoned in matter. It appears as, as the Euboreus, the, the tail eater of the Codex Marianicus, which from the 10th or the 11th century together, the legend is the one, the all. Anto, Pan. Time and again, the alchemists, the alchemists reiterate that the work, the opus, proceeds from the one and leads back to the one. Mercurius stands in the beginning and end of the work. Well, he's got a great section here on on noose, uh, on the intellect. Um, the whole goal of higher consciousness is an awakening noose, which is intellect. And uh, Mercurius possesses the hermetic dual significance. Um, talks about the Neo-Pythagoreans and their view of the soul was swallowed by matter and only mind, noose, was left. But the noose is outside man. It is his daemon. One could hardly formulate its autonomy more aptly. Noose 
seems to be identical with the god Anthropos. He appears alongside the Demiurgos and is the adversary of the planetary spheres. He renders the circle of the spheres and leads down to earth and water. You could say he read the time is. And what page was that was that there? Uh, 289. Thank you. Um, hmm. This, as contemporary evidence shows, noose, the divine daemon, the god-man, the puma, insofar as the, as the standpoint of analytical psychology is, is, is real, realistic, it's based on the assumption that the contents of the psyche are realities. All these figures stand for an, an unconscious component of the personality which might well be endowed with a higher form of consciousness transcending that of the ordinary human being. So he does understand news. Um, um, get one more for you. Um, oh, that's a section he's going to try to reconcile with Christianity. Um, Conclusion. Um, this is part of a uh, analysis. Um, all from the very earliest times are agreed <clears throat> that their art of alchemy is secret and divine. And likewise, that their work can be completed only with the help of God. This science is theirs, is given only to the few, and none understands it unless God or a master has opened up his understanding. The knowledge acquired may not be passed on to others unless they are worthy of it, since all the essentials are expressed in metaphors and can only be communicated to the intelligent who possess the gift of comprehension. The foolish allow themselves to be infatuated by literal interpretations and recipes and fall into error. When reading the literature, one must not be content with just one book. One must possess many books, for one book opens another. Moreover, one must read carefully, paragraph by paragraph, then one will make discoveries. The terminology is admitted to be quite unreliable. Sometimes the nature of the coveted substance will be revealed in a dream. The material lapis or the material stone may be found by divine inspiration. The practice of the art is a hard road. It's the longest road. The art has no enemies except the ignorant. That's the end of the work. Wow. How do you like it? Does he, uh, does he know something about philosophy? Oh, oh excuse yeah. me. I could have. Yeah. Here you go. What is this? Yeah. Alchemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump, David. Yeah, uh, just a, one of many thoughts. Um, wouldn't it have been nice if he substituted the words 
self for the word stone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Isn't right. that what he's yeah. trying to get at? That's what, that's what he does. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, unless the stone is something more, I've got them. No. I talk to my doctor. Yeah. About yeah. Them. <laughs> the the philosopher's stone. Yeah. 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 Well, what do you think? Uh, I'm here. How close is his work to Gnostic yeah. philosophy and Plato? Very far. Yeah. Right? Gnostic philosophy. Therefore, we're having a. Uh, yeah. A write in, and everyone must sign. They were going to send him a letter saying, Why didn't you put your title above your great uh, office, the philosopher, and take down the psychoanalyst, right? Analytical psychologist. <coughs> Fair enough? Fair enough. All right. Uh, Hold it. So, was alchemy a. Uh a way for people to do philosophy under uh, disguise. Under disguise, under the impression of the church, by using a different set sure. of terms. Mm -hmm. Well, and if so, uh, did alchemy itself carry philosophy forward in any way? That's right. Um, <clears throat> that second part. <clears throat> Why did it start? Why did it end? Now, in those works that we passed around are graphs that represent the dates of each one of the major alchemical works. Mm -hmm. right. Take a look at the big the sp spikes in each one from the different countries and ask yourself, what was the social, political, religious atmosphere at that time? Might there be something or some relationship to what was going on at the time? and the need of these philosophers to go under hiding, to become alchem alchemics, al alchem alchemists. Mm -hmm. But I haven't done it, but you, we, can, we can volunteer. I think, um, who do you think would be there? So you're Jeff, talking Jeff, 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 Jeff would be out Yeah, yeah, there yeah. it is. About yeah. these, these pages. So, so, do a nice social history and you can see what must have been going on at the time. And you can write a book on the relationship between social, political, and alchemy and make a book. Will we be revisiting that work that Barbara has in uh, other discussions? Yeah. Like yeah. Maybe one more Friday. time. Yeah. One more time? Yeah. Yeah. There's very fine sections. <clears throat> And I'd like to go over them, but I just tonight wanted to get rid of you. <laughs> Fair enough? Fair enough. All right. Let's get a cup of coffee. Hold it. Did, was he or did he practice alchemy or is that just a commentary? Pardon me? Do it again, David. Was he or did he practice alchemy or was that more of a, a scholarly commentary? Well, in, in essence, what, he, what he's saying is find the ancient philosophers, spend all your time studying it, start doing inner dialogues with, with, with yourself, with the inner voice. That's alchemy. Yeah. Then amplify it, meditate. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, he stresses imagination all over the place. Yeah, but it turns out not to be imagination. It turns out to be the, the ability to indulge in that kind of activity to yourself with another partner within yourself. He calls it alternately, the anime calls it God, he calls it an angel, he calls it whatever you want to call it. He also calls it demon. Well, they have a rich That's an act of imagination. Well, they have a rich system of sim symbols, right? No. Which they communicate the states of mind through the symbols. Okay. Then there's a the whole other side of his work. He's going to try to show the alchemical symbols represent philosophical concepts. But then he gets so caught up in them, he talks about them within themselves and interrelatedness, and he never gets back to its philosophical import. Yeah, go ahead. We don't necessarily stress imagination in our practice of philosophy. Yes, you like, do. I'm pleased no, no. I didn't get through my last comment. Okay. He has two ideas, imagination and amplification. 
Right? You have to be careful where he finally describes what he means by ample, by uh, <laughs> uh, meditation. Yes, let me do it over. Um, yes, what does he mean by that term? And you see, it's an act of imagination to think you're talking with someone when you're not. Okay. You're talking within yourself to someone, a daemon. That's an act of imagination. Okay, like when I meditate <laughs> and I get stuck and I imagine dialoguing with a teacher. He, he would way. say a daemon, God, or an angel, anyone will do. Okay. Then he stresses the need for amplification, which is to explore it more fully and detail as much as you can. Use analogies, remember the key part of analogies. So. Very Platonic in that respect. But, but, but that, that, that is different, I think, than what Josh was saying. That's different than a Tantric Adrian. That's right. Right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We often you're, 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 you're dialoguing with a higher, a higher being. But you can't do that without imagination. Okay, okay but like I'm an just... archetype or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what about taking a break and then we come back and do training? Well, Hold it. I like that idea of amplification. Yeah, do it. It's like, it seems like it's what you <laughs> can't tell people. When you yeah. ask, have you been in that state of mind yeah. before? Yeah. And that's the psychological context that's right. of the dream. That's right. That's so, right. Um, I like yeah, that. That's philosophical and right for that. Same thing. Right. Amplification. Hey, Pierre, we'll do some dreams after. It, it's awesome that you're doing this because I almost put something on the, the Facebook page about a week and a half ago. I was contemplating the daemon, daemon uh, according to Socrates. We know that's not news, it's not logos, it's not idea. Daemon is something different. Well, uh, say it again because I'm not sure I got your point. Um, Socrates uses the, the, the language. Yes, daemon. It's not logos, it's not news, no. and it's not idea. No. It's, it's an inner voice. And in the apology, he describes it. That's what it's he pays dialectic. attention to. Yeah. Yeah. The goal would be to engage that in a dialectic. And by the way, <clears throat> that matches Proclus's uh, meditation. And book. Uh, Let's see chapter 11, I believe. Okay, and how Pierre, about a cup of coffee? Maybe Pierre, haven't you uh, told us in the past that to get that conversation started, it's good to do the Xenophanes? Uh, Wait a minute, who's there? Uh, yeah. Samoa. Uh, is that the same kind of conversation that you've told us in the past uh, results from asking the Xenophanes question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gets the news and the daemon. Yeah. The conversation with self going. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Okay, for a, a break? Yeah. Okay. Yeah.